So hi everybody, my name is Anne O'Loughlin Bosman and I was an Epic alum in 2002 and that really began my journey into the business world. I was sitting in a seat just like you guys here tonight and um, I was actually just talking to my colleagues that when I was at Tufts, uh, the word business wasn't even a part of my vocabulary. I was very much interested in international development and uh, you know, changing the world, and I came from a history and Spanish double major. Um, so I definitely did not have the background uh, or what I thought to be the education to go into business, but I still ended up there. Um, and basically what happened uh, was uh, the theme of our global, uh, or of our epic year was global inequities, and this was 2002, 2001, 2002 school year. And um, I met a gentleman through Epic that was doing research on sweatshop labor, and in particular the um, migrant labor phenomenon of Southeast Asia. And I just really resonated with that topic, and I really wanted to get involved. Um, and so I ended up writing a huge long paper about it my senior year at Tufts. And that um, when I graduated from Tufts, I had no job opportunities, and I ended up becoming a waitress so that I could pay the bills, I connected with this, this same man um, and he had an idea that he wanted to start into a business that would help solve some of the, the issues that we had studied together in terms of sweatshop labor. Um, and so I ended up working for him um, and starting this business uh, that was a, an apparel company that provided an alternative to sweatshop apparel. And that's what really got me started on um, on having a passion for not only business, but uh, social enterprise. And between that probably decade of, of my working in the social um, enterprise space, it was, it was barely just a thing. Um, back then in 2002, corporate social responsibility was, was hardly um, a concept, let alone an, a, a readily um, understood concept or that people, everyday consumers would have on their on their minds. Um, so I was really excited to kind of delve into this area of how business could make a more immediate impact, um, you know, rather than some of the other jobs I was looking at in the nonprofit world that were more about grant writing and, and um, advocacy and things like that. So, so I started in this, this very scrappy bootstrap startup, um, worked there for five years, ended up working in the uh, social entrepreneurship space uh, for about 10 years until I got completely burnt out um, and took a little bit of a step back and realized that uh, I needed some of those uh, business, uh, that business education that I didn't necessarily get uh, while I was at Tufts, like financial planning and profit and loss management and things like that. Um, so I ended up going to Babson College uh, for my MBA. Um, and while I was at Babson, I was also managing a small startup that was much less in that kind of global inequities environment um, and corporate social responsibility environment. And it was uh, much more in line with kind of what it was a hot new idea locally and in, in moving more into the tech space. Um, and when I graduated from Babson, I ended up leaving that company. Um, and that's really when I crossed that threshold uh, from kind of small, startup-y, changing the status quo, changing the business as usual into a more traditional organization. And that's when I worked at um, Harvard Business School in their department called HBX. And Harvard, as you know, is one of the uh, oldest institutions in all of America, and their business school was founded over 100 years ago. And so this was a very kind of dinosaur-esque ancient uh, school <laughs> um, with very bureaucratic policies and HBX was working within that as almost like its own little startup in the online education space. Uh, so I worked with, with HBS and kind of helping them determine what does business education look like for them in the online space, how can we uh, leverage these new technologies and these new, um, uh, new formats uh, in order to still reach the school's goals and really help them progress as as education is transforming in the digital age. Um, and I did that for, for almost two years. I, I would have stayed there a lot uh, longer if I um, wanted to or if I could have, but what happened was this: the role that I have now at General Assembly, um, the opportunity was brought to me and it was just too hard to to resist, so I ended up jumping back into the startup world, but it was very different um, because General Assembly is venture capital backed, so we have money, um, and that feels really good. And um, and I am now I serve as their uh, regional director, so I oversee all of our operations in 
Boston and Providence. And um, like he mentioned earlier today, um, uh, General Assembly is really trying to help close what we see as this global skills gap where the digital age is transforming the skills that employers need uh, their employees to have and uh, candidates these days aren't yet equipped with those those specific skills and and those skills are usually around coding uh, data science data analysis these really high-tech fields that have emerged in the last five ten years um, and education hasn't yet caught up uh, to teaching people those those hard skills in addition to their soft skills so um, that's what GA does um, as well as help kind of diversify the um, tech talent pipeline um, really bringing some underrepresented minorities into that mix, um, some people from different socioeconomic backgrounds that might not have college degrees or have access to um, this new, these new jobs in these hot fields, which are also very in-demand and high-paying. Um, so that's our mission at, at General Assembly, and it, and it really helps fit kind of my theme of being mission-oriented and having a social impact, given, even though I'm in the world of business and for-profit, Revenue generating business, um, and it is still very much, you know, kind of a, a, a global scale given the, the fact that GA is a global organization, even though I'm much more locally founded here. Um, and I basically got all the way through uh, my undergraduate. I was in Epic Global Cities, uh, which was fantastic. Um, and I actually remember in 2008, I was planning to travel to Turkey throughout it to go to Istanbul and Diyarbakir. Um, and compare how uh, religion was impacting liberalism in each one of those places, compare and contrast. And that's when the financial crisis hit and the funds were gone. <laughs> um, so first of all, I, I never doubted it, but it's great to see the IGL um, doing really well. Um, and uh, you know, after that, I worked in the US Capitol uh, over a summer. I was an intern there. Uh, I uh, was really excited about the prospect. It was this great big building. I was working with all these important people. And I got there and I was just amazed that the systems they were using were incredibly antiquated. There were policies and procedures that prevented people from getting their jobs done. Um, and it really uh, turned me off of what was happening. You know, just one example was that um, I would get a bill from the, the congressman I was working with, who was the chair of the Democratic Caucus at the time. And uh, I would walk from office to office and I would get signatures on this bill. Um, but before I did that, I had to call each office and they wouldn't give you the phone number of the person you had to speak with. I had to speak with a defense staff or an education staff or someone else. Um, so I had to call the receptionist in the office. So I called the receptionist and then if the person was in, the receptionist would pass me on to the other person. We'd get through all the phone conversations, I'd walk to the office, I'd get the signature. It would take me half a day to get all the signatures going from building to building because it's a network of all these different buildings. And then I would get back to the office and there would be a three word change and I would have to start the whole process over again. So I propose some very simple things. Can we have a centralized contact list? Are there different ways we can make updates without getting all the signatures again? And the answers I got were just hard notes without uh, a lot of constructive feedback. At the same time I was there, I met these two guys who had just started a pilot program at Georgetown uh, called the Compass Fellowship. It was a fellowship to train college students to be social entrepreneurs. Um, I'm amazed that you were in social enterprise uh, as early as you were, it's fantastic. I got into social entrepreneurship at that point in time, and I didn't think it was a thing at all. And, uh, so it, <laughs> it it's amazing. It was a thing in 2002, but like a tiny thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was just like a little uh, spark, um, and it, it's fantastic how it's grown. Um, but at, at that point, it was really kind of revolutionary, and um, I loved the concept. I, I spent the summer working more with them than I did um, at the U.S. Capitol. And I ended up bringing that program to Tufts and ultimately affiliating it with the IGL because the IGL has been great. Um, and uh, the program was essentially a year-long um, uh, fellowship where the first semester you focused on your personal growth, what are your passions, what do you like to do, um, what are your goals in life. And then the second semester was learning those hard skills. So you always need that combination of soft skills and hard skills. So let's take all your passions and let's translate that into finance, marketing, everything you need to do to actually launch your own business. And at the end of the year, the 15 freshmen who are in the, the fellowship, and it was run by five upperclassmen mentors, then actually launched their own businesses. In practice, not everyone launched their own businesses, uh, but there were some really fantastic outcomes, including Balba's speech is one example, uh, which is Jack McDermott, who now works for Panora Panorama Education. Um, but he had a really bad stutter growing up, 
Um, over time, he, he learned to control it, but he, it cost him thousands of dollars. Um, and he had to travel two hours to see a particular specialist and get that treatment. Well, he built an iPhone app that did the same thing that a clinically trained doctor could do in um, listening to his voice, understanding the different intonations, making recommendations on how he could improve his voice. And I was really passionate about, about working with these different people, making that type of change, and I absolutely loved the program. Um, so over the course of the next few years, I, I expanded that program in Boston, brought it to a few other schools, and became the Boston Regional Director. And we actually made a company um, out of this social enterprise um, that's now called Social Impact 360. Um, it's now at about 15 campuses uh, around the country. Um, we have a, a national conference each year. Um, so I, I worked my way kind of leading national operations and then onto the board. I was recently board chair. Um, and then after, after a period of time, decided it was time for me to step down, let the, uh, the next leaders come in and, and run with it. Um, and at that point, I was a few years into working at Arcadia, which is my day job where I came in uh, when I graduated Tufts. Um, so Arcadia Healthcare Solutions uh, is a data aggregation and analytics company, um, but it focuses in the healthcare space. Frankly, I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, I, I did not do a good job picking a company. I didn't really understand what I wanted to do. Uh, I had, you know, thought that this business thing was cool, and I, I recognized through what I did with Compass that it could really help people. Um, but I, I didn't really know what businesses did or why I would want to be with them, or you know, is profit really their their sole goal? Um, and what I, I learned at Arcadia is that. Um, you can't have really well-intentioned businesses that do really great things. Um, that is kind of the social enterprise model, but there's a whole spectrum behind it. Um, so what I did uh, at Arcadia and what I continue to do is I go into individual doctor's offices, I work with them to understand how they interact with patients, how they enter data into their systems, and then I bring together the data from hundreds of different doctor's offices into one platform on which we can do analytics to understand which doctors are treating patients well, what are they doing that's treating patients well, which patients are at risk, aren't receiving the care that they deserve, um, and where are the costs in the system. So uh, there was one patient who went into the emergency room 562 times in one year. That's not good for the patient. That's not good for the taxpayers. That's not good for our healthcare system. Everybody loses there. And the second we identified it, we could have someone actually go to the home of that patient and, and significantly reduce um, the cost to, to taxpayers and also improve that patient's health a lot. Um, now, it is a growing business. We have venture funding, so we have very specific um, financial targets that we need to meet. Um, and I think it's really important to understand, uh, you know, the differences between for profits and non profits. And in parallel to all the work I've done in Arcadia, I have a non profit track. Um, it started with what I did at, at Compass, uh, but over time it grew into uh, joining the board of the Local Streets Alliance, uh, which is in downtown Boston. It's rethinking urban transportation. And it's really based on the, the fundamental idea that when you walk out your front door every day, based on where you are, uh, the type of infrastructure you have around you, the types of signaling and, and uh, bike paths and cars and crosswalks, uh, you feel safe or you don't feel safe, you feel like it's easy to interact with people or you just want to keep to yourself and you want to put your headphones in. Um, and you also want to have access to every place that you want to go, right? Can you get to the this, this school? And, and walk your children there? Um, can you, uh, you know, go to your friend's house easily in a comfortable way? All those things make a huge different, difference in people's lives. Um, and, and through that, I also realized that while I really like what I'm doing at Arcadia, and I, again, I still do, uh, I, I wasn't necessarily getting out as much as I needed to. So I actually took time off, I took four months. I, I got in the car, whisked my girlfriend away, and we drove around the country in a huge loop. Uh, and the goal was to see as many national parks as we could. We went to 15 different national parks. And I met a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and it really, really opened my eyes to, to other um, aspects of what I could do. I went to Georgetown. I got a, an executive certificate in nonprofit management. Um, and I actually built an analytics product for someone that I met that helps um, her organization evaluate um, the social impact that she's able to provide through a fellowship that. Um, I saw a really parallel with Compass, and, and therefore I really got engaged with it. Um, so I, I always try to have different groups of people in my life, different types of impact um, and, and business that I, I um, bring to the fore and kind of run in parallel. Uh, I think that works for some people. Other people, it's better to, to fully invest in one thing. Um, but I find that I'm really able to learn from having these different work streams, different groups of people in my life at the same time. 
Um, and a lot of what I found is really valuable to the business environment. Um, is understanding how different people treat the same product, or the, the same um, problem, um, and then taking ideas that people in one industry or one type of business don't necessarily think about and apply it to another one. Um, so I've really focused on building technical skills throughout that process. I have a lot of data integration skills. Um, I'm very familiar with what General Assembly does. It's fantastic. Highly recommend it. Um, but uh, I think there are, there are lots of different great paths in business. Um, the healthcare industry in particular I've really enjoyed, and I work a lot with educational institutions which started with Compass. Um, but happy to, to take any questions you have, and, and really excited to be on this panel. Why are there so many successful, big, innovative companies? Why are they all in America? Why is Tesla and Apple and Facebook and, you know, all the Amazon, why are they all in the United States? What is it that creates that dynamic? Is it, are there not entrepreneurial people in other countries? Is it the way our capitalist system is set up? What, what is the catalyst for that? Why, why is that distinction there? But of course, it's a self-serving question. And the thing I'm going to say is that I think one of the main things is the capital markets in the United States of America, that no other country has the breadth of financing available for start for angel investors and venture capitalists and growth equity and private equity and buyouts and debt, public markets. And when you look at the fact that Tesla has never made a profit and has raised billions of dollars, Facebook raised billions of dollars before they ever had a dollar of revenue. What other country in the world has a system that provides capital to companies in that basis? And I think that it's worth noting that, A, because we're in a state that has a senator who's very negative about financial services, and I also want to just highlight for you that financial, there are a lot of interesting things and a lot of good that comes from liquidity in capital markets to help support amazing entrepreneurs and people building businesses. So with that as a background, how did I get here? Because I didn't take a single finance course. I didn't know anything about business. I was an international relations major. I studied abroad in China. I actually minored in Chinese in 1986 when people would point and stare at me when I went to when I was in China. And I had an amazing experience at Epic. And what I really thought was I want to work somewhere like my Epic class. I want lots of people yelling at each other, debating <laughs> things. That would be an amazing place to work. And it wasn't easy to find that job, but that was what I was interested in. I was fortunate that because I had studied in China, because I was interested in international relations, I um, attracted some interest from the investment banks uh, into their training programs. And I thought just to try to make this interesting, I would just tell a couple stories from different parts of my career and how I, how I kind of got there. But when I, so I, I literally knew nothing about finance. I was given an accounting book before I started. I actually went to China over the summer because when I came back and told my friends about my studying abroad in China, they all wanted to go. We went. It was 1989. We had the Tiananmen Massacre. I was stuck in the country. I thought I was never going to get home. I was going to be fighting in the revolution. Fortunately, we snuck out of the country on a boat uh, and because they shut down the airports and, and trains. Anyway, made it to the training program, showed up. I was out of 70 kids. There were less than 10 that didn't go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Um, and so I was very intimidated. And I just decided that since, the, and all those kids showed up and they said, well, when am I going to a board meeting? And when am I going to be on a private jet? I said, how can I, can I get you a cup of coffee? Can I make copies for you? I'm just happy to be here. And over time, that allowed me to actually distinguish myself from the other kids with their uh, uh, their Ivy League degrees. And, uh, but I got a chance to learn about private equity and learn about the investing. I was advising them. I was a junior person working on advising them. And I started to see that our clients, these investors, were making a lot of the key decisions. We were giving them advice, but ultimately they were making the decisions. And they were also living with the companies for longer periods of time. We would give advice and go away. We'd never know what really happened. They were sort of um, really owning it and being part of it for a longer period of time. And so I said, you know, that looks pretty interesting. Uh, I remember my boss said that if corporate finance is a language, then private equity is the poetry of that language. I thought that was a good line. So I decided to defer business school and I went to work at a venture capital firm. Uh, I had been doing a lot of 
uh, sort of more mature company stuff, I thought it would be great to see venture capital. And so I showed up to see what early stage investing was like. And I remember uh, the first week, one of the partners said to me, Brad, we're, we're meeting with a, a biotech company. Went in, guy had been a professor at Harvard Medical School. He walked us through, he had the cure for cancer. I mean, he walked, it was brilliant. I mean, he was diagramming on the whiteboard. This is the cure for cancer. We walked out of the meeting and my uh, boss said to me, what'd you think? The cure for cancer. I mean, we, we got to invest in this. I mean, it's unbelievable. She said to me, listen, let's wait till the end of the week. Two days later, another biotech company's come in. Professor comes in from Princeton, doctor, genius. He's got a cure for cancer. Basically, what I realized is it's really hard to tell which cure to cancer is going to be the right cure to cancer. And what I realized is that early stage investing is challenging because there's a lot of unknowns. You're trying to figure out what is, what is the market opportunity, what is, is, which product is going to work. It's very challenging. So with that, I got recruited to uh, a very large private equity firm that did what you guys would think of as buyouts, uh, which is you know, putting debt on more mature businesses, helping to drive efficiency and run them. And I had an experience to do that. Um, and I stayed there for 10 years uh, and I enjoyed it, but I found that these mature companies, I could only add so much value. They were already very large. They were very mature, wasn't very dynamic. And mostly we were, you know, making sure that they weren't defaulting on their debt and kind of generating cash flow. And I realized at that time that I really was much more interested in the combination of those two. I wanted the growth of venture and I wanted a little more data, a little more uh, information there that I could sink my teeth into to make my decisions. And at the same time, I didn't want to work with large companies. And so I met a firm that specialized in growth equity. Growth equity is looking for companies that are... The market's defined, the product's defined, the business model's defined, but they need money to take the company to the next level. So maybe they have 10, 20, 30 million in revenue, they're growing 20 to 100% a year, and they need capital to take them to the next stage. They need advice. They need to figure out how to build the infrastructure to scale their business. And we ended up partnering with a firm, at my, well, I was my old firm that did that. They got very excited about me. I got very excited about them. And they invited me to open the New York office of their firm. And that's how I got to FTV. And so what we do is we specialize in investing in enterprise technology and services that are innovative solutions to make enterprises better and in financial services. How do we make the provision of wealth management, insurance, payments, uh, any kind of financial service better. And those are the two areas that we specialize in. And we get to work with amazing entrepreneurs. Uh, I have uh, right now, for example, I sit on eight boards. I have one in Shanghai, one in India, two in the UK, and the rest are here in the US. And they're all serving uh, you know, very either large enterprise markets or working with enterprises to sell products and services to consumers. Just to give you a sense, our average portfolio company over the last five years grew at like 48% a year since 2012. And it's, you know, from my perspective, it's extremely rewarding to see companies growing, creating jobs, and hopefully offering something valuable into the marketplace. And uh, what's nice is it, it's very fresh and each day is a little bit different and I get uh, you know, I think the little ADD in me appeals, uh, finds it a, a nice to, to see a lot of different things. And, um, you know, I thought it would be worth just spending a minute on why it's like Epic and, and kind of what their job entails. So, I guess first in terms of what the job entails, there's kind of four key things to think about. One is you have to be analytical in terms of analyzing data about markets and companies, they're financial. Another is you have to be good at, at judging the people. Do you want to back them? Can you trust them? So you're a little bit of a psychologist and making sure that you're, you're backing a team that has the right values, the right uh, energy and enthusiasm and discipline. Uh, the third thing is you need to be a negotiator because you've got you to gotta be able to negotiate a deal. You've got to be the kind of person who likes to you know, who, who enjoys haggling for a used car or buying clothes on sale or whatever, uh, or going to a market in a third world country and haggling for that 
uh, you know, tourist item. Um, and then the fourth part is uh, you have to have investment judgment. You have to be able to put all that together and synthesize it. Um, so those are the key things to, to make a deal. And then obviously over years when your hair is the color my hair is, you have a lot of lessons learned that you can impart to entrepreneurs to help them be more successful and more mostly telling them mistakes that they shouldn't make that you've seen other people make. Um, and so that's what the job looks like. And when you think about that investment decision and you think about me sitting with my partners debating whether or not we should make this investment and what price we should pay and what's going to happen to the market, and which competitors are going to win. It's kind of like an epic class. It's a you know, different topic, but that's the spirit of what we're all doing is looking at the data, looking at the primary research, trying to make sense of all that information. So that's, uh, that's a summary of what I do. So I'll start there. Um, it's not necessarily how hard you work. It's what you do with, with the time you have and how you devote your energy. Um, so that's, that's all really important. Work-life balance is defined in many different ways. Um, so I, I really encourage you to take it to heart. I personally, when I get excited about an idea, the next six hours are me sitting in front of com a computer calling everyone I know and hashing it out. A lot of other people I interact with have no it. They don't understand why. What would compel me to do that, right? And then when I want to get away, I take four months and I drive around the country. So that works well for me. I would not recommend it for everyone, right? Um, so I, I would say it really is kind of up to you. And, and your priorities in life change over time. So I was really willing to completely commit to a company right when I graduated college. And now I'm realizing at some point, you know, there are certain savings goals I have and I want to build a family. Um, so I, I really do think you can't underestimate um, kind of your life context and where you are at a certain point in time to uh, what your life work balance should be. I think um, corporate culture these days is embracing work-life balance. Um, you know, as the labor market is getting more competitive, a lot of the employers are trying to be more competitive in terms of what they're offering and how they're recruiting. And so I know... I feel we're in a phase led by some of the giants where, you know, benefits are a lot more attractive, like they're trying to be a lot more attractive. So, you know, flexible vacation time. At GA, we have no vacation policy. You take whatever time you need. Um, things like that. We're working from home, remote work. It's a lot more, people are a lot more comfortable with it now. And so I see it as being less of an issue now and in the next few years than it was maybe, you know, 10 years ago. Um, my my personal um, view of it is that I ran myself into the ground, as I mentioned. Um, I started for companies in like, I don't know how many years, as many years. It was a little bit of a disaster. And then when I went to business school, I was also running a startup at the same time. So I had massive burnout. Um, and that was a big reason also that led me to HBS is because I wanted the nine to five, clock in, clock out, you know, like just total opposite life that I had before, which was 24-7, always on, you know, can never work hard enough. Um, and it was almost a reason why I didn't go to GA, because I was like, oh God, startup world, startup world, startup world, like, I don't know if I'm ready. But I can tell you that I was not happy inherently at HBS, like when everyone literally clocked out and left at 5.01 and I'm still sitting there, I was like, come on guys, let's, where's that vibe, let's go. Like I liked the family vibe that comes from kind of a little bit, like a little bit different of a work culture, but it doesn't have to necessarily come at the expense of your life. And I think GA in particular is a really good company in terms of that. And so when I did take that leap, I was very pleasantly happy with the benefits and that's what kind of um, opened my eyes that like, oh, startups and, and co companies in general, I think are a little bit different now. They're, they're taking a lot more seriously to Steve's point that I think the understanding of productivity is a little different now. <coughs> Leadership and management understands that you need that time away. You need to rejuvenate. You want your employees to have work-life balance because otherwise you will run them into the ground and, and your company will not be better off for it. So now I feel like a really bad boss. Um, <laughs> finance is not a place for people who want work-life balance. Um, Don't tell I, that I, anything I just said. Yeah, <laughs> your secret's safe with me. Um, my team is probably ordering a dinner right now in the office. Um, and I worked, you know, when I started, I worked 80 hours a week for the first two years. And I loved every minute of it. And you, you just have to make a personal decision 
what you want. I, mean, I, I you know, for me, I, the way I look at it is I wanted to find a job that I was so passionate and I was learning enough that engaged me like that. I kind of thought, I, I was laughing because I thought, I can't imagine learning any more in business school except they're paying me a lot of money instead of me paying them a lot of money. This is great. And I was just happy to learn as much as I could and I thought it was fantastic. Obviously, as you get older uh, and you take on more responsibility, your time allocation and your, the job description changes. But if you're graduating college and thinking, I want work-life balance, you're probably not going to love the kind of jobs that you get at the beginning of your career in finance. Um, and you know, I think that, again, I, I think that the, the trade-offs of thinking about that is you're working with very dynamic, high energy people, you're learning a lot, you're very well paid for your time and energy, uh, and it's exciting, but it is exhausting. I mean, I, you know, I have a, a guy who actually, a Tufts grad who I hired as an associate at my firm, who this morning I got an email, he sent it out at 1.22 a.m. We are trying to close a deal in the UK, there was an analysis that was needed, he got it out so that the people who were in London could have it first thing, that's not going to happen often, but it does happen. And that, so, just trying to give you a sense for the spirit of that culture. I mean, you know, look, I think the question is how do you handle the mistakes you made? I, I think, um, you know, when just early, just trying to think about things that might be relevant to, to you guys as you're starting your job. I, when I started um, my first week on the job, at the very beginning of my career in investment banking, full of enthusiasm and excitement, one of my bosses asked me to uh, do an analysis over the weekend. And I, with all my uh, confidence, I said, I'll bet you $100 I get to do it right by Monday morning. And he said, great, let's do it. And I literally had to work, you know, all weekend. I worked, you know, 100 hours and I brought it in. I thought I got it to right. And, it was wrong, and I lost the $100. But the good part of it was, he was really impressed that I made that effort and paid my $100. <laughs> but I then had his confidence going forward, and so yes, I screwed up and I didn't do it right, but I did establish that foundation with my who, what became one of my mentors. And so sometimes mistakes can also be positives. Um. I, I was uh, very ambitious when I came into Arcadia. I learned some things right off the bat. And we had our biggest, baddest, best uh, customer just come through the sales process. We were really excited about it. Um, it was going to be our first full-scale analytics delivery on a new product. Um, and I, I requested to leave the whole product, the whole project. Huge mistake. Um, it, it got to a point where, uh, when I should have had a full project team, with a, a project manager, you know, a business lead, a technical lead, um, a number of developers, regardless of how it was structured, those were the general roles. Um, basically ended up short-staffed, and every time someone left the project, I said, that's okay, I'll pick up for that person. I ended up working 90-hour weeks um, through the weekends, uh, ended up losing the customer. It was, it was a pretty bad situation. Um, I did get a free MBA, similar to what you mentioned. When you work hard, you do learn a lot. Um, so I, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and the best news is that um, they're our customer again. So something went right over the course of that. Uh, but I, I really didn't understand what I was getting myself into. Um, I like very directly led to a bad situation for the company and a bad situation personally because I burned myself out. Um, and at this point, I can spot that type of situation from a mile away. But at the time, I, I just didn't see it coming. Um, I'd say one of my, maybe not my biggest mistakes, so the five years that I ran my own company, I made so many, we'd have to go out for drinks and like, you know, work all night long, but you probably didn't know about that drink so for a few years. But, um, yeah, I'd say like the, the most recent mistakes that I feel like I'm always about to make it again and again, it's more of like a leadership lesson in that I learned at HBS and now again at GA I have a lot of practice in that I hate politics and I am very very transparent and honest and I don't like playing the games and sometimes you have to and so I'm trying to understand that balance almost every day of like 
when to kind of put on the face and perform, because it is, my, my boss at GA told me this, and she's very right, it's a performance when you're leading a team or a company or whatever, and when to be, but still be authentic. And so I think I've made a couple of mistakes where I've been too honest, too open, spoke my mind, threw somebody under the bus inadvertently, and in a place like Harvard Business School, I made those mistakes a lot. Like, it, I told my boss there that it was almost like I was stepping on landmines, and she was like, yeah, you are. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> um, and so, but at the same time, I didn't want to just keep my mouth shut, you know? So it's kind of like, how do you raise a flag, manage up or across in a non-political way that doesn't rock the boat? <laughs> so it's it's a tough, it's a tough, thing, I think, to really nail, and I'm, I'm still working on that myself, even though I have all these years of experience, it's still something that sometimes I'll trip up and I'll be too honest, and especially when I have a team, they'll, they'll pick up on, they'll pick up on it and run with it, and then the next thing I know, someone on a global team is calling me being like, I heard this from your team member, and you're like, whoops, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we're going to differ on this one. I would say, and so I hire people a lot, right? Like we hire and, and recruit. So when I am looking for a candidate and somebody that I want to hire, uh, I always go with the person that has those baseline liberal arts skills and is the culture fit before the hard skills because you can always train, right? Like if you don't know Excel, but you are a fantastic, all those, everything that, that Brad said is on um, point, you know, analytical, um, confidence, innovative, creative, energetic, like all of these things that I want to see influence, like how well are you at influencing, it's really all those kind of like people skills that, that I'm most interested in, um, in terms of my team, and, and it's that kind of just like, um, just that confidence that, that I would prefer, because anything hard you can always train you on, always. Um, so I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but um, but I would also recommend too, just take advantage of everything that Tufts has to offer. Because coming from General Assembly, you can walk down to General Assembly and take that class at any time in your career, but like the Tufts community, the Tufts education, everything at IGL is a little bit harder to, to find out in the world. Um, while, you know, there's a plenty of online options for some of those harder things, but I don't know if you guys, what you think, but. I completely agree. I look for the, the people first. Um, that's the number one criteria in hiring. Uh, I think that personally, it's really important even outside of the job to know personal finance. So that, that doesn't mean you need to know advanced things, but you should be able to build a balance sheet, manage a budget, those types of things. Uh, similarly, and it probably dovetails in um, with Excel, but I haven't seen a job yet where uh, being able to do the lookups and pivot tables, which are simple Excel functions, but people consider them advanced when they haven't used Excel. Um, they're just incredibly important. So I, I think if you can prove that you have a, a mind that's organized, and you can um, you can structure your thoughts in coherent ways, you can build a story when you need to, you can communicate effectively with people, um, all of those things are what I would look for in hiring. hiring. And if you have those, I'm confident that you can pick up a database querying language, or you can start working on software engineering, and you can build out you know, more advanced financial uh, skills over time. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously part of it is what is it that you want to do if you have any idea that that helps to frame some of these things. I think, I guess the thing I will say is I didn't take any of those classes. Um, I do think when I did finally start studying accounting, I was like, wow, this is actually really valuable and interesting, and I'm glad I understand it. And so I think there are certain things you should say. What are the skills that I, at some point I want to acquire, and when do I want to acquire them? I, I will say that. Um, you know, I, I think I read an article I thought was very thoughtful on the topic of computer science, which is you don't have to be a great programmer, but you need to understand enough that you can explain what you want or articulate it. And I think that I think that that is something that is good to have. Um, I do think, I mean, I, I very much worry about personal financial literacy in America, and I think it is very good to have that as a, a baseline that everyone should understand finance enough. Um, so I, you know, I do, I do think that that is good. But I, I will also say, just on the hard skills point, I remember when I interviewed for my investment banking job, the managing director said to me, "Every formula you need to know, I can put on the back of a business card," and that's really true. You know, it was very intimidating, but the truth is, it's not that complicated. So I, I think I would focus on some of the other areas um, that are that are maybe harder. Google it.
Yeah. 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 became my best friend in business school. <laughs> <laughs> Google everything. <laughs> and I would add one, one other thing, which I'd be interested in your, your take on, but one of the pieces of, of advice that I really took to heart uh, when I think about startups <coughs> and what it takes to build a business is that for the most part, you're either trying to beat Microsoft Excel because you're trying to build data structures, or you're trying to beat Facebook because you're trying to build a community. And almost every startup I see out there, at least that's trying to make money as its primary purpose, is trying to beat one of those two. Um, sometimes it's trying to beat both at the same time. And there are very few companies that actually succeed just at beating those two pieces of software.